Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other, cause Jesus is the way. The third major encounter with God in the Jewish calendar is called Tabernacles. And it celebrates our call to spiritual warfare, our victory over sin, our marriage with Christ, victory over Satan, and dwelling with Christ forever. It includes the Feast of Trumpets, which is a 10-day feast, the Day of Atonement, which is one day, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, which is seven days. So let's start out by looking at the Feast of Trumpets, or what they called is Rosh Hashanah. It's also called the Day of Judgment, or the Day of Remembrance. It's the Feast of the Ingathering at the end of the harvest season. Let's go to Numbers 29.1. In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. It is a day of blowing of trumpets unto you. And ye shall offer a burnt offering for a sweet savor unto the Lord, one young bullock, one ram, and seven lambs of the first year without blemish. And their meat offering shall be a flour mingled with oil, three tenths, deals of a bullock, and two-tenths deals for a ram, and one-tenth deal for a lamb throughout the seven lambs, and one kid of the goats for a sin offering to make an atonement for you. Beside the burn offering of the month, and his meal offering, and the daily burn offering, and his meal offering, and their drink offering, according to their manner, for a sweet savor and a sacrifice by fire for the Lord." The Feast of Trumpets begins on the Jewish calendar New Year, and this is important. In Rosh Hashanah, which means the head of the year, the Jews believe that God created the world at this particular time. The rabbis believe that on the New Year, which lasts two days, the Lord opens three books. The first book is the Book of Life, and the righteous receive life, welfare, prosperity, security from evil, from harm, from peace. Then the second group, the neither holy, righteous, or wicked, which lists their deeds, and they are given ten days to repent, called Yomen Noraim, which means the fearsome and awesome days, and is based on their repentance. God will judge them on the Day of Atonement, giving either life or destruction, riches or poverty, health or hurt. And the third category are the wicked, and they will get condemnation and hurt. Either you're living righteous, you get a chance to repent during this time period, or you're going to be in bad trouble when we come to the Day of Atonement. It was also called the Feast of Remembrance, when the books of remembrance is opened, when God moves on behalf of someone. Remembrance means a memorial thing, to speak on behalf, as God said, say, concerning Noah. Malachi 3.16 Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord, and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day when I make up my jewels, I will spare them as a man spareth his own son and serveth them. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. The day that Noah removed the covering from the ark and found the dry ground was exactly the day of the Feast of Trumpets. The main function of this feast is to prepare for the Day of Atonement, which is ten days later. It is commemorated only with the blowing of the shofar trumpets throughout the day and the giving of sacrifices. The shofar is in remembrance of the ram sacrificed in the place of Isaac. 
Jewish tradition is that God blew one of the ram's horns on Mount Sinai at Pentecost when giving the law and would blow the other at the coming of the Messiah. To the Hebrew, it represented the voice of God and the power of God in warfare. Usually, two trumpets were sounded, but were later replaced by the shofar, which was also blown on the feast days and the new moon at the beginning of the month to muster troops for battle, to awaken the dead. So resurrection will probably occur on the Feast of Trumpets. The Jews called God the horn of their salvation. That meant that God would fight their battles and save them from their enemies. When we're doing this, I want you to be thinking about now, what in the world does all this stuff mean, right? Because that's where we're going with it. To the Jews, the meaning of the blowing of the trumpets. First, it was a call of repentance for the dead to live again through repentance and regeneration in preparation for the Day of Atonement. Secondly, it reminded the Lord of the covenant of Israel and to deal gently with them, not according to their merits, but according to the promise of Abraham. And the third one's very interesting. It was to confound and confuse Satan because they believed Satan especially accused Israel at the new year. Sacrifices. Two young bullocks, one ram, seven lambs of the first year without a spot, and 100 priests blew the trumpets. The burnt offering is for sanctification, the meat offering is for consecration of works, and the sin offering is for our inadequacy. What was not here again? Remember last time? No trespass offering. Why is there no trespass offering? Because Jesus took all of our sins at the cross, it's a done deal, right? Also, there was no peace offering. Why is there no peace offering here? Because remember, we got peace from God at the Passover. The seventh month was also the last month in the religious season. It was a time when God would complete his dealings with people that year. So what do you think that's going to tell us in the future? This is going to be God's ending of dealings with people in general. In history, the hot summer months are the church period that fills the gap between the first and the second coming. The days of awe are ten days before the Day of Atonement when it was said the gates of heaven were open to hear repentant prayers. So what is this like that we're dealing with here? What's its meaning? Well, we're going to look at the meaning from several different aspects. The first one is, what's this in the tabernacle? Remember, I always relate back to the tabernacle. This is the altar of incense. And what do you do at the altar of incense? You pray, you praise, you worship God. And what is that a type of? Spiritual warfare. See, when they blew the trumpet, what was one of the reasons they blew the trumpet? To go into warfare. Remember what we have so far. We've had peace with God, and now God has given us power, and now in these feasts, it's time to sign up for the armies of heaven, and it's time to use that power in spiritual warfare to go on and take the land. What did it mean in taking the land, the story of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt and going to the promised land? Well, what was last time? Last time was crossing the Jordan River, wasn't it? So where are they now? Now they're going to go in and they're going to sanctify themselves and they're going on to battle to take the land. So what's our job in this feast? To take the land that the devil has taken back from the devil and give it back to God. That's what trumpets are all about. This is a time of spiritual warfare in your life. This is a time of taking all the things the devil has taken from you and taking them all back. Well, it's a call to spiritual warfare through prayer and worship, which are our primary things we need to do. Why? The rest of the things were all done by Jesus, weren't they? They're already completed. They're already available to you. So now we need to use what God has already given us. Strength and power come from God through Jesus the trumpet of God. We must stand in victory 
and what he purchased for us. Remember we talked about the armor of God before? Let's look at that just for a second and see what it really says. See, every aspect of the armor represents an aspect of what the Lord Jesus has symbolically done for us. He has completed it all. He is the one that provides that armor for you. And the question is, are you going to use it? Ephesians 6, 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Whose armor is this? It's God's armor. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having to do all to stand. Now, why does it say that? Because it's all done for you. You already have it. All you have to do is stand. You don't have to go out and do it. Jesus already did it all. Stand, therefore, having your waist girded with truth. Jesus is the truth. Having the breastplate of righteousness. Jesus is our righteousness. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Jesus is the good news. And above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Our faith in Jesus is which provides us the deliverance from all of these things and those thoughts in your mind. And you use that, your faith, of what Jesus has already done. When the devil says, you don't measure up, what do you say in the shield of faith? Jesus has already done it and he's already measured up. Clink, the dart is stopped. And take the helmet of salvation. Jesus is our salvation. And the sword of the Spirit. Jesus is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance. What did Jesus do? He persevered for you. And supplication all the saints. He interceded for you. So do you see the idea? Again, although this is a calling us to spiritual warfare, God has provided everything that we need for this spiritual warfare. You're totally armed to go and take the territory from the devil back. And that's what we're talking about here. How about the future prophetic meaning and fulfillment of revelations? This is the rapture. This is the call of the armies of heaven to come up and join in what? The marriage supper of the Lamb, when we're joining the armies of heaven in preparation to come back at the final time to take everything back from the devil and take the world back. What are we also going to see here? We're going to see here the judgment seat of God in which we're rewarded. That's all going to take place. That's all part of this in the future here. Revelations 4.1 After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up thither, and I will show thee things that must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Here is the good news. You're called to be in the army of heaven, but when the tribulation is occurring, where are we going to be? Up in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb, preparing for the final conquest of the earth. Okay, that was the first one. That is the Feast of Trumpets. Now we're talking the Day of Atonement. Forgiveness or ransom. And it begins at sundown on the ninth day. It's also known as Yom Kippur. This is the most holy day in all Judaism, the day when Israel would be forgiven their sins and would not face judgment. Prophetically, it represents the beginning of the tribulation period, which is the judgment of sin and rebellion on the earth. The gap between the end of the Feast of Trumpets on the end of the ninth day including the Day of Atonement, to the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles on the 15th day is seven days by the lunar calendar, 
which probably represents the seven years of the tribulation period. Numbers 29, 7. And ye shall have on the tenth day of this seventh month a holy convocation, and you shall afflict your souls, and you shall not do any work therein. This is the only required fast in the entire Bible on this particular day. Now Leviticus 16, 11. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hand full of sweet incense beaten small, and bring it within the veil. This is the only time in the entire year that the high priest is allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. Verse 14, And he shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. Before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. This may stand for the seven years of the tribulation period that we were going to be delivered from that judgment for seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat, and before the mercy seat. Remember, the mercy seat is what? That's the forgiveness of God. That is the unmerited favor that God has for us because of the blood that was shed of Jesus. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle, the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. So he also took the blood and all the rest of the things to purify them, because it's only blood that purifies and makes holy. Verse 21. And Aaron shall lay his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all the transgressions of all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat and shall send away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all the iniquities unto the land not inhabited and he shall let the goat go into the wilderness. So there are two goats, right? The one goat is the goat that represents what Jesus did. It's the goat of the sin offering and it's sacrificed. Then we have the scapegoat. And what's the scapegoat all about? They're laying all the sins on the scapegoat. Where is that all back in the time of the crucifixion? We sort of understand that Barabbas was the one that was to go and be crucified, right? And what did Jesus do for him? Jesus took his place. So Barabbas represents us. But how about the two thieves on the cross? Well, one of them died, and the other one escaped and went to heaven, right? There are your two goats that are represented there on the cross. So that was the meaning of the two thieves and the one being saved and the other one dying on the cross. So the day of atonement was also the day of judgment. On that day, the fate of everyone would be sealed and the gates of heaven, the Jews believed, were closed. So basically, you could repent as much as you wanted to for the first 10 days. But when it comes to the day of atonement, this is judgment day. So what do you think this represents in the future? Judgment Day. Because of this, the Jews would perform many good deeds between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. These ten days were known as the Awesome Days, and they would greet each other with this greeting. May your name be inscribed in the Book of Life. It was the only required fast day. They would actually have a feast before this. Isn't that the way we do things, right? If we know we're going to have a fast, we have to go and become a glutton and have a feast the day before. In the fast, they were not even to moisten their lips if they were 13 years or older. 
and they said a cantor vows for the next year in prayers for forgiveness. It was a great day of national cleansing and repentance from sin. On this day, God judged the sins of the entire nation. All the Jews gathered near rivers, brooks, or the ocean to cast away their sins. This is called Tishalek. Today as substitutes, because how many Jews are sacrificing all these animals? They're clearly not. So they use as substitutes repentance, prayer, suffering, or charity. There are even some Jews in Eastern Europe that beat themselves with 39 lashes. The high priest cast the lots for the two goats. The Lord's lot fell on the one for the sin offering. They tied a portion of crimson string to the door of the temple and they tied the thread to the scapegoat. And when it turned white, it meant their sins were forgiven. Tradition says the signs of the thread changing color, the casting of the lots, and the westernmost light of the Camberella would not burn after Jesus was crucified. Because you see, before Jesus was crucified, it was the covering of the sin, right? But do they need that anymore after Jesus was crucified? No, that's sort of early church tradition. Isaiah 18, 11. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, like that thread, they shall be white as snow. Though they be like crimson, they should be like wool. The high priest was assisted by over 500 priests and it was separated from seven days from the people and washed his body five times and his hands and his feet ten times in preparation for the atonement. He then appeared before the presence of God imploring the Lord by his mysterious and sacred name Jehovah. You know how the Jews took all this. Listen to this. The Jews accused Jesus of doing miracles by misappropriating this name Jehovah, which was allowed only to the high priests. That's how they explained Jesus' miracles. He sprinkled the most high place, the veil, the altar, the incense, the altar of burnt offering, cleansing them from defilement. Now the priests did four basic things on the Day of Atonement. The first one is, he took the fire from the altar of incense. That's prayer and intercession, right? Now, why did he take that? So he wouldn't die. Remember, here is the priest, and he's going to walk into the Holy of Holies. And so he would put a bunch of incense and make a bunch of smoke. So when he came in there, he wouldn't see the Shekinah glory, and therefore he wouldn't be killed. So it was a protective measure that he took. He offered the sacrifices, and of course Jesus was our sacrifice, and he sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat of the ark seven times. And the word mercy seat is propitiation, which is also what Jesus did for us. And the final thing he did is this. He would pronounce the words, it is finished. Where do we hear that before? When Jesus finished it, when it was all complete, he said, it is finished, and that's exactly the words that the high priest used. The high priest had to do it all himself, and no one was allowed to touch him until it was through. John 20, 17, Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and to your God. So do you see why Mary was not allowed to touch him? Because on this day is when he went into the heavenly temple. And this is when he fulfilled this particular feast. And he wasn't allowed to be touched until that was completed. The majority of the blood sacrifice was poured at the foot of the altar. What was Jesus' altar? The cross. And his blood was poured at the foot of the cross. When Jesus came to them in Luke 24, 39, he said, Behold my hands and my feet, that is I myself. Handle me and see, for spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. Why did he not say flesh and blood? 
because his blood was all poured out at the altar. The high priest didn't wear his garments of glory and beauty on this particular day. Why? What did Jesus do? He put aside his garments of glory and beauty in heaven and came down and became like a normal person. When you saw the high priest on that day, he looked like a normal person. He wasn't wearing his garments of beauty and his garments of glory. So again, it represents Jesus. There also was no place in the Holy of Holies to sit down, remember? So where did Jesus sit down after he completed things? On the throne of heaven. Another interesting thing is that the year of Jubilee, and what's the year of Jubilee all about? Freedom. And the year of Jubilee began on the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 25.9 then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all of your land and you shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof and it shall be a jubilee unto you and you shall return every man into his possession and shall return every man unto his family so what's this meaning what's going to happen in the final jubilee the entire world is going to return to the kingdom of God and we're all going to get everything back and we are going to take over the world again from Satan. What's the meaning in the tabernacle? What is this symbolized in the tabernacle? This is the mercy seat. This is the unmerited favor. How about in taking the land? After they came into the land, they had to have a time of sanctification before they went in and they were able to declare the victory. What's the meaning for us as Christians? This is conviction of righteousness. Let me show you something that might be interesting here. A lot of people sort of misinterpret this verse. John 16, 8. And when he was done, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Verse 9. Of sin because they believe me not. What category of people is he talking about here? Who is he going to convict of sin? Unbelievers. Of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more. What are we going to be convicted of? What does the Holy Spirit convict us of? Does he convict us of sin? No, he convicts us of righteousness. He convicts us that Jesus has already done it. It's already completed. And then we have a final category in judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Who is going to be judged? Satan. So what happens here? We need to be convicted of God's unmerited favor in our righteousness that Jesus has already done it. So what does that mean about judgment? We're not judged. We're totally free. You don't have to go through the tribulation period. You don't have to deal with all these things because Jesus already completed it for you. The future prophetic meaning to be fulfilled in the Revelations. This is the beginning of the tribulation period, the judgment seat of Christ. What's the judgment seat of Christ? That's when Christians are judged for what they did here on the earth. This is the rewards. This is that remembrance. Remember the book of remembrance? All the things that are written down of all the things you did for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one may receive the things done in the body according to what he hath done, whether good or bad. And the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelations 19.9 And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they that are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. The gate of heaven is another topic they talked about, and it suggests the concealment during the tribulation period of the seven days concealment at the marriage. See, during the time all those terrible things are happening, and Revelation sees them all from heaven, doesn't it? Why does Revelation tell you this story from heaven instead of from the earth? Because we're up in heaven. And the second return of Jesus begins just before the Feast of Tabernacles with the great sound of a trumpet and the return of the armies of heaven. Revelations 19.11 
And I saw the heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And the armies that were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. What is fine linen, white and clean all about? Righteousness, remember? We talked about the priest's garments before. A covenant of testament has to have proof of death. See, what's a covenant? A person dies, it's a will, right? So if we have a will, what do you have to have to get the things that come along with a will? You have to have a body. You have to prove that the person has died. So do you see that the sprinkling of the blood before God is the proof that Jesus has died and we are now come into the new covenant and all of the things of the new covenant we've been talking about in this entire class are what? Your inheritance. It's a legal document that says all these things are yours. And now we come to the last feast, the seventh feast, and it's the Feast of Tabernacles, and it's called Sakot, or the Feast of Ingathering, or the Feast of Booths. And this represents the millennial reign of Christ. When we get here, everything has been accomplished. And we'll see that as we go through this. The Jewish ritual meaning was God's faithfulness and protection through the wilderness and taking the promised land. And so they would all live in booths and they would make these booths out of branches of trees to represent God had been faithful through all of the turmoil. What's that say to us? Has God been faithful for all of the turmoil and the struggles in your life? Then you can celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, right? Now, how do we do that now? It hasn't all happened yet, has it? Through faith. See, do you believe this is all going to take place and it's all going to plan out the way God planned it? Is anything that God planned or ever failed? No, it's never going to fail, so we can start celebrating now. You don't have to wait for the rapture and to be called up into heaven. It began on the 15th day and lasted seven days. It represents rest after the final harvest. Leviticus 23, 39. Also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. And the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And you shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. And you shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths, that your generation may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now this is Numbers 29, 13. And you shall offer a burnt offering, a sacrifice made of fire, of the sweet savor unto God. Thirteen young bullocks, two rams and fourteen lambs of the first year, they shall be without blemish. And their meat offering shall be a flour mingled with oil, three-tenths deals unto every bullock of the thirteen bullocks, two-tenths deals of every ram of the two rams, and several tenths deals for each lamb of the fourteen lambs, and one kid goat for a sin offering. Beside the continual burnt offering, this meal offering and drink offering. And now verse 17, And on the second day, that's of the feast, you shall offer twelve young bullocks, two rams and fourteen lambs. And it continues and continues and continues down till we get down to seven bullocks. This seventh feast represents the completion of the finished work of God in the present eight. It's the rest that God wants us all to enter into. And I'm suggesting you can enter into that rest now, and we'll see that 
uh, in the scriptures. You don't have to wait for the rapture and the tribulation period and coming back in the second coming and going into the millennium. Although it primarily represents the thousand year reign of Jesus, which is going to be total peace because the devil is going to be where? Yeah, chained up in the bottomless pit, right? Until the very end. On the 15th day of the seventh month for seven days in booths, as when they were brought out of Egypt. The wanderings in the wilderness were only temporary. And what's that saying about us? All of our life right now is only temporary. It's something God is going to totally replace. There was a ritual of pouring out of water on the last day of the feast. It's called Hoshoshana Rabbah, or the day of the great Hosannas. Hosanna means save now or deliver now. They were praying for rain or God's salvation through the Messiah. They made special thanksgiving offerings for the rain uh, that he would send. Notice in faith. It pointed to the Messiah who would give them the living water. A certain priest would draw water from the pool of Shiloam in a golden pitcher. The high priest would pour the water into a basin at the foot of the altar, suggesting that when the Messiah would come, he would cover the whole earth as the water covers the sea. That's Isaiah 11, 9. What do you think this is talking about? Jesus? The priest would blow trumpets and the people would wave palm branches, singing, Therefore with joy you will draw water out of the wells of salvation. That's Isaiah 12, 3. The Sadducees thought the branches would be used for building the booths, and the Pharisees thought they were to be waved. So they did both. They also brought citrus fruit, symbolizing the fruit of the promised land. Jesus declared, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So do you see, in each one of these feasts, when we don't understand this, we don't see that those things that Jesus did, he did at a particular time during the feast, and it all had meaning to them. Then they also had light in the temple. The Jews carried torches to light Jerusalem, giving thanks for the sun and recognizing God himself as a spiritual light through the Messiah. Jesus declared he was the light of the world at this time. So Jesus was tying into each one of these feasts as he was giving them an insight about himself. They lit torches around the temple, suggesting the Messiah would be a light to the Gentiles. Okay, so why the materials that made up the booths? First, we have the palm tree. It means radiant Christian life and austere conditions. Then we have the myrtle tree. Happy, radiant Christian life. The citron tree. It's a type of fruit tree suggesting fruitfulness. And the willow tree. The Jews would actually take the willows and hit them on the ground. It was called... Arabah, and it represented the shedding of sins. So what's this all telling us if we tie it together? What are the booths saying? All my sins have been shed, even though it may have been a struggle because of what Jesus did. I'm now a radiant Christian, and i am got everything together and living for God. They had numerous sacrifices. Remember the 13 bulls, then the uh, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, and 7. You add them all up, guess what you get? Seventy. And the Jews felt this represented the 70 nations that would be in the world at the time of the beginning of the millennium. The decreasing number, I'm going to suggest, this was all for what? A burnt offering. Going back to our offering study, what does the burnt offering talk about? Sanctification. So what's this telling us? There's a process that's going on here of our sanctification, and guess what? You have to do less and less and less and less about it, right? In other words, you don't have to sacrifice as many animals. That was their efforts. But our sanctification is going to be through what? What Jesus did. And we're going to find out when we enter into our rest, we enter into our rest by ceasing from our own labors as he did. See, how much of my life am I doing and I'm running the show? Am I relying on myself? And how much am I relying on Jesus and not relying on myself? 
Do you see the pattern? It should be less and less and less until you're totally relying on Jesus. The two rams. The rams are a type of the Lord Jesus who is available unto sinners as a substitute in time of need. I'm going to guess the two probably stands for the Jews and the Gentiles. The 14 lambs. They're to eat the lamb at the Passover, and the more we eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, the more we become like him. Right? 14. That means there's seven for the Jews and seven for the Gentiles. And seven is what? Completeness. That we need to have completely taken all of him into us. The kid of goats for the sin offering. It's all taken care of, isn't it? Totally, completely. And notice something else. On the holy convocations, what was one of the requirements? They could not work. So what's this all saying to us? It's not you. It's not your work. You're not allowed to work for any of this stuff because it is all by grace. It is all by the unmerited favor of God. What's the meaning in the tabernacle? This is the ark and the Shekinah glory, the very presence of God. When we come into peace with God, we're entering into his very presence. The meaning in the promised land. This is when they had finally finished taking the entire promised land. Have you taken all of your promised land yet? You better get on it. Jesus is coming soon, right? Here's Joshua 21:44, And the Lord gave them rest round about according to all that he sware unto their fathers. And there stood not a man of all their enemies before them, the Lord delivering all the enemies into their hands. Do you see how it's talking about rest? This is all about rest. Hebrews 4, 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Who finished the works? Jesus. He said, it is finished. And how was it that certain people didn't enter into their rest? Because they didn't believe. Your rest in life is when you realize that Jesus did it all, and you just trust in, rely on, and commit yourself to him, and accept what he's already done, and then you can do what? Hebrews 4 and 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own labors as God did from his. Jesus has finished. God has provided it all. It's time for you to be finished. And cease from your own labors. Cease from your own worries. Cease from your own struggles. Cease from all the stuff that you're doing and just believe and rely on and commit to everything that Jesus has already done. The future prophetic meaning and the fulfillment in Revelations. First, there was silence in heaven and there was a book that had seven seals on it. Now, what is that all about? When they made a will, if the will was for a very important person, they would put seals on this will. And this is the will, this is the deed of the earth. And who is the only one that could open the seals? Jesus. And this is the beginning of the Jubilee. So what was happening here? The deed is opened. The seven trumpets are blown. Those in the tribulation are released. The earth is redeemed. God's people are restored to their inheritance. And Jesus established the Sabbath of the millennium for a thousand years. Let's look at some verses. Revelation 10, 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, what's he sounding? A trumpet. The mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And now Revelation 11, 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there was a great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. How about the millennium? Zechariah 14.7 And it shall be that whosoever 
will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. Even upon them shall be no rain. Verse 18. And if any family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, there shall be a plague whereupon the Lord will smite the heathen that will not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. What's it saying? It's saying in the millennium there are still going to be people that are not believers and so on and so forth, but they will bow the knee and they will serve God and we will reign with them and we will be the rulers during the millennium and we will be at rest. Why? It's not based on us. It's based on what Jesus has already done, what is already accomplished. That's how we enter into our rest. And there will be a great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium. Revelations 20.11 And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which was in it. And the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to his works. And where is this eventually going to end up? Revelations 21, 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So the tabernacle in heaven, at which all this stuff is modeled after, is what's going to happen. In the new heaven and the new earth, it is going to descend and we're going to worship in the heavenly tabernacle at the very end in total peace and in total rest. So how does this happen? How do we put this all together now in practical terms for you and I? The first thing, let's look at these feasts again. What do we need to do? We must heed the call to arms to join his team. That's trumpets, isn't it? That's the rapture. That we're going to be there. We're going to be part of the armies of heaven. Second, we must accept all that he's done in his unmerited favor. That's the atonement. That's how we escape judgment from all of these things. And finally, we must enter into his rest based on what he's already done. Here's an interesting verse. John 1, 14. For the word was made flesh and dwelt, and the word dwelt is tabernacled, and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory for the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So how do you do this? What's this all about? Go to John chapter 15. The word abide here means to be close to, have a relationship with, remain with, dwell with, continue with, tarry with, endure. So it's a whole picture that you and Jesus need to be like this. It's all about the answer to all of this and to simplify it all down is that in the Feast of Tabernacles, it's all about us tabernacling with Jesus, Him living His life inside of us and through us and us being part of the body of Christ, that we become one. And let's see what the Bible tells us about this. The first thing we need to do is to allow God to purify us through our relationship with Jesus Christ, the Word. And remember in the candlesticks, what they have to do? Trim the wicks. Otherwise, they wouldn't burn very bright, right? John 15, 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is a husbandman. 
Every branch in me that bringeth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. So we need to let the word of God purge us, change us, transform us. We need to allow him to make us fruitful. But how do we become fruitful? How does a branch become fruitful? Does it go around saying, I'm going to grow cherries, I'm going to grow cherries, I'm worried I'm not going to grow cherries? Does it do that? What does it do? It, it just abides. It just stays connected. See, this abide says what? Stay connected to Jesus. Remember the candlestick? Jesus was the central stem. If you're a light, stay stuck into the candlestick. Be part of the vine. How many of you have heard of Hudson Taylor? He was a man who started the Inland China Mission. He's got a whole book out called Hudson Taylor's Secret, written by his kids. You know what Hudson Taylor's secret was? he realized he was part of the vine. He sort of said it this way. For a long time, he felt it was his job of being part of the vine that he had to suck the sap out of the rest of the vine in order to produce the fruit. In other words, he was trying in his own effort to do what God told him to do. And then one day it dawned on him. No, is the branch part of the vine? Yes. Are the vine and the branch the same thing? Yes. The example he used is, how would you like it if you went to the bank and you wrote a check and handed it to the teller and said, I'd like my money? And the teller said, I can't give it to you. Your hand wrote that. What would you say to him? The hand is me. So what is it saying here? You are Christ. And if Christ asks for something, if you say something in the will of God, because now if you're in the branch, you're going to be listening to God and doing what he tells you to do, is he not going to answer that? No, you and Christ are one, and because you're one, look what the Bible tells us. Verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Why would he not answer it? If you're doing what he tells you and you're bearing fruit for him and he wants to bear fruit, would he not give you freely all things as the Bible says? We must maintain a loving relationship with him. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you and continue you in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. The result is you will be filled with joy, just like he is. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy may remain in you. So where are we getting the joy from? And that your joy may be full. And once we do all of that, if we really have that kind of relationship, knowing that Jesus did what? Sacrificed himself. Then we will lay down our lives for others. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So I have a question for you. Are you ready to cease from your own labors and hang out with Jesus? Because that's what this is all about. Jesus has already provided everything. Let's go back and look at it. What did Jesus provide you back in the Passover feast? Everything is done. Your old man has died. Your reliance in yourself has died. Your sins have been buried. You've been risen to a newness of life. That was the feast of Passover. And at the feast of Pentecost, you've been reconnected to the power source. And you now have all the power that Jesus has to carry out his mission. And now in tabernacles, you have been called into the army of God. You've been declared per perfectly righteous. And you're ready to move into the rest that God has had for you all of your life, relying on him through faith. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. 
that you have called us to be part of your army, to go forth, and you provided all the tools and everything that we need for the great victory in taking back the world from the devil. And we ask that you would help us, Lord, not to rely on ourselves, but to rely on you and to serve you and to follow you and to tabernacle with you and mentor into your rest. And we give you all the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Why? Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Cause Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other.